happy using some sustainability ideas as well. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining. Today is Seeking Sustainability Live number 125. Amazing. <laughs> and we're talking about staying home with your kids, keeping them entertained, curious, teaching them. And uh, Lee is with us. Thank you so much, Lee, for joining. Hi. <laughs> so originally, you're from Australia, right? Yeah. At whereabouts? You told me and I forgot. Yeah, everyone forgets the name. It's called Mullumbimby. How could I forget that name? That's a fantastic place name. I love it. <laughs> and what? Yeah, little Round Hill in our Aboriginal language, actually. Little Round Hill. Yeah, because we have a little round hill in our town. Very nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, tell us a bit of your backstory. What originally brought you to Japan or got you into child education you can give us whatever backstory you'd like okay um so i've been in japan now for 18 years so i studied japanese in australia i majored in it at university and i had friends at university saying you should be a teacher you should be a early childhood teacher and i said no 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 because that's what my mum does and i was not interested so i came to japan and i worked teaching English I worked in hospitality I did that for five years and then I decided that I did like working in early childhood so um, I'd been teaching English at preschools and kindergartens and I wanted to become a real teacher so I went back to university in Japan and got qualified as a kindergarten teacher and then I worked in preschools in Japan for five years until I had my first girl. Yeah. That's awesome. So mm -hmm. you actually got uh, your education, your degree in teaching from Japan. Is that right? Yes. So in, yes. Jap in Japanese? In Japanese. So I went to a Japanese college and studied everything in Japanese and worked at a Japanese preschool, like a temple run preschool. So it was a traditional Japanese school. Yeah, and I actually work at that college now teaching teachers in training. So come full circle. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Frass 2015. Thanks for joining Frass from YouTube. He says, great, I'm doing the same. I'm teaching kindergarten too. Great. Wow. Thanks. Thanks for joining. So how, if you grew up with your mom as a teacher and then you, you trained learning the Japanese system, were there any like big differences that you noticed or big similarities when you were doing your training? Mm, a thing I really remember about my mom teaching, she did a lot of inclusive teaching, the integrated teaching with kids with disabilities. So that's also another thing that I find really important. So kids of all abilities and all nationalities and just any kids that are a little different, they shouldn't be made to feel different. Just having like an inclusive educational environment is so important. So sometimes in Japan that is not happening at the moment quite yet, which is a little sad. So I'd like to see that happen quite soon actually that's yeah. one of the big differences I notice okay yeah that's that's definitely something that we hope improves um that's I did notice that that a lot of um, schools for kids with disabilities physical or mental are kind of usually in a different school separate school not in the same school system some public schools though they have it in the same building but at a different level um yeah I guess it's case by case right I think so, yeah, it depends on the child and the school as well. I know that um, in preschools and kindergartens, a lot of schools don't accept kids with disabilities because 
their facilities are not catered for children that might need a little extra help or something like that. So that's a reason why they don't accept a lot of children sometimes, which yeah. is sad. That is sad. I'm showing your Instagram page right now. So if people want to follow some of your ideas, uh, you can mm -hmm. check out two underscore play underscore our underscore day to play our day. Yeah, you didn't make yeah. it easy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm new to Instagram and it's very sparse. Because <laughs> it takes me a lot of time to figure out how to put yeah. things up. But no, you have I some climbing some, over me. Some I great examples that we'll talk about today on your Instagram. Uh, Frass says, I love teaching preschool, but teach English. How was the transition from working to going to school back to working? I want to do the same, but worried about my visa. Work now, we'll watch later. Oh, okay, so uh, yeah, if you're not teaching full time, it might be a, a visa difficulty. What happened to my language? Um, but you're you're married to Japanese. I am now, right? But I okay. didn't. I wasn't married the whole time I was at school and when I was teaching. So yeah, I did go through a lot of difficulties getting visas. It was okay studying because I could have an um, exchange student visa and that if you get an exemption, it allows you to have a few hours of part-time work a week. But to get a visa to work at a preschool was very difficult. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your ideas. I love your schedules. Tell us about uh, your schedule. Yeah. Okay, well... I've never really had a schedule before and I'm very impulsive. I don't like to plan what I'm doing. I'll wake up in the morning and think, oh, great weather, let's go to the beach. Or I like to work like that a lot. But with Corona, that all changed. So you can't just decide to go somewhere now. You have to make a booking in advance. And for me, that's really difficult because I've never planned anything before. But uh, during the corona, when the pandemic started, so my eldest, she goes to preschool, but she didn't go to preschool from end of February until June. So she had three months at home. And at first, when it wasn't really such a big thing, we were still going outside, playing at parks. But then lots of other people started playing at parks and the parks were just full of people. So we'd be at home and my youngest one, is obsessed with television. So it would just be like, mommy, I want to watch television. Mommy, I want to do this. And once the television is on, it's on all day. And another thing that I was finding trouble with is getting the housework done and playing with the kids. So if I'd start cleaning, I'd find somewhere else that needed cleaning. And my whole day would just be endless housework, telling the kids, just wait, just wait, sit down, play by yourself, which was not fair on them. So I thought we need a schedule. We need to we need to have time to do our work. They need to see me doing the work. They need to help with the work, but they need play and they need exercise and they need this. So I thought we'd make a schedule and we'll stick to that. And it was so good. And even now on weekends, we stick to a schedule. So we've changed our schedule since like February, March, April, when it was still cool. And then through the summer vacation as well, we had a schedule which I changed completely because things we were doing, like outside play, we'd play outside all through the morning, but now it was too hot. So we changed our schedule around so that we'd have like, we'd wake up, we'd eat our breakfast outside and play outside and be home before 10. And then we'd do our housework around our chores. And then we'd have play together time. And I even had television time and YouTube time so that they know that if they do all this and it's after lunch, it's YouTube time and they can wait and accept when it's time to turn it on and time to turn it off. So it helped everyone be stress-free and everyone got to do something that they wanted to do. And you also, you're an avid runner, so you were also able to schedule in your running time or your of course you need some me time for yourself as well right so maybe while yeah. they were having youtube time or tv time you could have some me time i think that finding that balance is really hard um for a lot of 
moms and dads right now. Um, I heard from so many parents that they were appreciating the teachers so much more during coronavirus because they're at home trying to help with homework, trying to teach the kids and stuff. So you've, you've been integrating play and learning and free time. So having this schedule, do you go over the schedule with the girls at the beginning of the day? I have a big poster that we wrote and I stick it on our front door. So we have the days of the week on our front door. And I have photos of the kids doing activities like bike riding or ballet dancing or painting, just thousands of photos, and they're all stuck on magnets. So every day we stick our activities on the day anyway. But um, when we used our schedule, so we've got a big poster, and we'd go and, like, for example, one of them, um, we have outside playtime. And they had a choice of activities. We could do ball play or skipping, bike riding, running, uh, hopscotch. And they had little pictures. They choose the activity they want to do and stick it in the time slot. And that we do the same for everything. So um, we had learning time. They could choose their English reading and writing, their hiragana. They could choose numbers, shapes, because they're still three and five. It's not really school. So for us, well, we can do like learning animals, body parts. So they choose what they want. So they just use the photo and put it in the time slot on our schedule. So everyone knows what we're doing today. And then when it gets to that time and they say, no, I want to do this. We go back to look at the schedule and say, no, look, we've chosen this today. If you want to do that tomorrow, we'll choose it tomorrow. So everyone, you have to stick to it or it just ends up everyone doing what they want when they want. Yeah, no, it seems like a great strategy, and it's it's great to hear that it's working with you, both you and the kids. Um, let's talk a bit about some of your outdoor play. I, I see I'm showing the flower pressing right now. Okay. So yeah. tell us about your art adventures outside. I love to have art adventures outside. Like, I love doing anything outside. But um, the flower pressing especially, this is a hobby that I've discovered since the coronavirus pandemic started. So when it first started, we take long walks outside. We live on the river, so we can walk along the riverbank. And the grass would get overgrown and long. And up until now, I was always like, why don't they mow the grass? But then when we started taking long, slow walks, I would notice in the grass all these little wild flowers. And they were beautiful, and there were so many varieties. And I got out my old wildflower book and we'd look them up and um, I'd take photos on my phone and use Google Lens and just investigate what the flowers were. So that whole flower thing started with the pandemic and it's gone through spring, summer and now into autumn. Every flower I see, I'll catalogue it. So those flower pressing art activities we did, I had found this overgrown area that had so many varieties of wildflowers and we'd gone and seen them but then a friend told me about painting with this one type of flower and I knew that there was lots of those flowers there so we went and just collected lots of flowers and we tried pressing them we tried squashing them we tried all different sorts of things and it was outside so the kids could go off and play when they wanted to and come back and enjoy the flowers and it just it turned into a completely different activity to what I was expecting, but it's just getting them to notice their surrounding environment and seeing how beautiful it is. And up until now, I'd taken them out places, like we'd gone for long drives to get to this special place I'd heard of. But since we can't do that anymore, it, it's just so nice to see all this beauty so close to you and to actually notice it. So that flower art adventure was just incorporating my newfound hobby pretty much and just seeing what colours can come out of these flowers. You know, it was just fun to do it outside. Yeah, that's great. And this Yamago bowl, uh, the really Yamago. purple, purple, like berry looking thing, yeah. I noticed that is in our garden and it makes a really strong, like, paint on the ground so that must have been fun to press and make color make art with 
<laughs> yes, and we even put it in a cup at the end and squashed it and added a little, little bit of water and painted with it. And our hands were just purple, our clothes were purple, but it was great fun. And it washes out, so not a big deal. <laughs> and, and hopefully your app told you that it, it wasn't toxic and it wasn't going to hurt anybody. I always worry about that. Like, am I touching like poison ivy or something poisonous? <laughs> but, yeah, we try to wash our hands afterwards. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, do you know what that is in English? Yamagobo? No, I only look up the flower names in Japanese because when I, and I've realized that if my phone's language is in English and I look on Google Lens, it'll give me the English equivalent, which is not always the same flower. Right, yeah. So I, when I'm looking up, flowers I have to specifically change my phone language to Japanese and then look up the flower on Google Lens and it just gives me the Japanese name because it's a flower I'm finding in Japan so I don't even look at the English names now wow yeah because sometimes they're they're not equivalent right Japan has uh, some very unique yeah, ones so like wild flowers they're Japanese what, native flowers a lot of them so they're similar but they're not the same yeah right and you're also a very good photographer. So you try to incorporate time for taking photos while you're doing activities outside. Is that right? Yeah, kind of like, as you said before, finding me time. It just doesn't happen because I'm with the children 24-7. So I know a lot of moms who want to do their own activities and want to do their own thing but don't have the time. And that find playing with children is not that exciting like going to the park. I mean, it's not a lot of the times, but um, I've been trying to incorporate m what I want to do with what the kids want to do. So the flowers is one of those things. I'll take them to the park or take them for a walk where they want to go. And while they're playing on the swings and the slides, I'm just looking around in the bushes trying to see what flowers I can find. And photography as well. Like I'll know a spot or I'll find a spot that just looks beautiful and I want to take photos so I used to love taking like landscapes photos of shrines things like that and I didn't like portrait photos at all but since I've had my two beautiful girls every landscape I see just looks more beautiful with them in it is what I've found so I'll go somewhere that I really want to take photos of and I'll just let them play and I'll just take photos as we're playing. Like the other day, we found this beautiful forest walk and they both had their brand new Elsa dresses on. And it was a lovely sunny day and we were just walking and they were getting tired. And my oldest one said she wanted to play Daruma Sanga Koronda. Do you know that one? You like hide and Daruma Sanga Koronda and you turn around and the other people have to stop. And we were playing that and I just had my camera here holding it and as she turned around, Arumasanga called on that, and she's like smiling at me. I've just taken these beautiful shots, like in action with this big smile, and there's beautiful photos of them playing naturally. So I try and I haven't been able to take my camera with me a lot because, as you've probably seen in a lot of our photos, we get dirty, we get muddy, we get wet, and I need lots of changes of clothes and shoes in my backpack, and my camera doesn't fit in. So a lot of my photos I just take with my phone, but um, I want to try and start getting out with the camera again. Yeah, <laughs> I I love. I mean, even even with your phone, you're so good. Your framing and your you know backgrounds and everything is so beautiful. You obviously have a good eye for photography. Um, I I love these photos in the puddles. You found a huge puddle. Now, one of the things that I remember seeing you is when we were racing and you run barefoot. So you're a big, yes. a big believer in barefoot and even in puddles on a rainy day. I love seeing your girls with their bare feet running around. <laughs> yeah, most of them are bare feet most of the time and naked a lot of the time. So... <laughs> So, um, also you did kayaking the other day on Ninoshima, was it? Yeah. So that was good. Um, we'd been kayaking. I used to have a sup. So when my eldest was young, I still took her out on the sup, on the stand-up paddleboard in the river where we live. But unfortunately, it died. 
so this year we went to Miyajima and went on a kayaking tour and the kids loved it and they were trying to paddle for themselves so I thought I'd heard that Ninoshima pool has you can do kayaking in the not swimming season so we went out and thought we'd try it out and um that turned in a whole into a whole big adventure that day so a lot of people when they go to Ninoshima they catch the ferry that lands closest to the pool go to the pool and then come straight back and catch the ferry from the closest terminal but we always like to go to the terminal on the other side of the island and it takes us half a day to get ourselves around to the other side of the island but it's just such an adventure it's such a different environment so we'll ride our bikes around or we'll run around we'll take the shortcut over the mountain um we call into like the little shops on the island to try and support the business there they're just tiny little shops and we've been to one <laughs> And the woman who works there just gave us more than what we bought anyway. And we just sat there and ate ice creams with her. And um, yeah, there's a giant slide in the mountain. You have to climb up like a thousand steps to get there. And they've got some climbing equipment. So we'll make a whole day and we'll go and play on all the things. And then we finally got to the pool an hour before it closed and we kayaked in the pool. Yeah, yeah. it's really fun. Uh, I remember taking the, my kids there too as well, and uh, it's it's amazing to me that they they thought of that. Like, what a, a great way to use the the pool. It's like a current pool, right? And yeah. what what a great way to use it when it's not swimming season, because swimming season is actually really short in Japan, right? And then they have yeah, they have. I'm showing the photos right now. Your kids climbing and going over rope bridges and stuff. It's there's a lot of great play equipment on that island too. So it's it's nice. Yeah, it is. And there's little sandy beaches on the way round, depending on the tide. There's this road on one half of the island. The road has been washed away with the rains and the floods we had a few years ago. So cars can't actually pass there anymore. So we'll go on our bike and if it's low tide and there's sandy beach, we'll go down there for a swim. Like we've taken body boards and everything and had a swim and you just camp on the road and yeah, you can make a whole day of just that tiny little island. I'm, I'm showing a picture now with you guys on the beach and you made mermaid tails in the sand. Yes. So cute. And <laughs> yeah, that's the, um, the boom at the moment. They all want to be Ariel. So every time we go to the beach, we have to make mermaid tails <laughs> it's well, really that's, itchy out of there actually yeah it's a good activity it takes up do you do you think of activities in terms of how long they might take up or you just kind of go with the flow and try to fit it in your day well actually since the, the corona pandemic started that's another thing that i'm really grateful for we've got time so always rushing to get my kids to preschool to pick them up to get them to lessons to get to my to gym or whatever it is it's always a rush but during the pandemic we had nothing so we can take as long as we like we can give up early and come home or we can just stay there whole the whole day like I don't when I don't have anything on I don't mind how long we stay there and I usually take jumpers or anything because usually we end up staying there till night time a lot of time I keep toothbrushes in my bag as well. So we'll play the whole day. We'll have dinner out. I'll clean their teeth and they can sleep on the way home and I just put them straight to bed. It's nice to have that flexibility, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Um, you also have, like, you do some artwork in the bamboo forest. It looks like you had a bamboo crayon sketch. Yeah, like, as I said, I like to incorporate just my interests and outside as well so we went hiking I wanted to take the girls hiking but my youngest I think she was still two at that time and my eldest would have been four possibly five so we're not really going to be able to hike a mountain but um I know there's a bamboo forest a part way up a hiking trail that we know of and I thought we could probably get there so we hiked and we got there and we had our lunch there too I think I think we had a picnic in the bamboo forest and I had some art supplies with me so we 
decided to make an art adventure of it and we drew some bamboo <laughs> yeah I it's love- good for them to actually see what they're drawing like I know when I was teaching preschool we'd always do seasonal art activities but we wouldn't actually show the kids what we were doing like we'll make a, a dongri an acorn out of this cardboard paper or whatever it is but they're not actually going to see any acorns or the flowers of that season so I like to find the actual flowers or whatever it is that we're doing artwork of and not just to see it and come home we'll often do our artwork in front of the flower or in the forest or at the beach it's just so nice to be able to see what you're actually making and know that it's real and you can feel oh this flower it's hot now this must be a summer flower sort of thing and they can experience the seasons as they're doing their artwork yeah I I have this picture here of uh I think it's Sen cutting clover with scissors yeah she that was a few months ago she would have still been two she just got into scissors and it was really dangerous because she still didn't know how to use them but she really wanted to and we were actually out fishing at the river bank and she got hold of the scissors that were in the fishing kit and there was some grass there and she said she wanted to cut it so I thought okay let's just see what that happens and it was a really good fine motor skill activity she was using the scissors and cutting just clovers or whatever it was so she's not cutting anything that shouldn't be cut she's not cutting herself and she had a lot of scissor practice actually she did the same thing today <laughs> yeah that <laughs> was cut bamboo sticks at the river yeah that wouldn't be a bad thing she could go and trim the grass if you had a little garden or something you could get yeah. get someone who has a garden come and trim my grass in my garden That's she can cool. she can cut my clover anytime <laughs> anyone who has kids and has a garden give your kids some scissors and set them out there great Scissor work practice and you get your grass trim too. Yeah. Are you fo- like yeah. Are you following don't need to. Are you following certain stages or are you just kind of going on what their interests are? So she she's interested in scissors. Okay, I'm gonna teach her how to use scissors safely. Or do you have kind of in your mind, oh, this is about the age she should have motor skill work or something? With my eldest, I was kind of like following stages. And um, so I've been doing artwork, like paintings with my kids since before they were one. So when my eldest was, I think she was three and a half, we went to Switzerland. And when we came back, we painted a picture of the Matterhorn. And I just let her do it all on her own. And we, like, we discussed all the different techniques she could use, all the different tools that we've used the different paints, the different colours, how to mix them, like all things that we'd done. And she did this amazing painting of the Matterhorn all by herself when she was three and a half. So up until then, we'd followed all these, like I wanted her to um, use all these different skills. So she had all these skills and she could do this whole thing. But with my second one, she's just sort of like, I'll just play and I was just like yeah okay but um she just um, she her interests are whatever is in, right in front of her so it's hard with my youngest one to introduce a new skill or a new activity because if she's not interested she just won't do it so if she shows interest in something I'll kind of roll with that and try and make some activities some different things that she can do to keep practicing that skill like with the scissors especially she's done the grass cutting and um just another really great easy activity with scissors just a regular piece of paper i'll draw two eyes and a mouth and then some lines all the way around and that's their hair she has to give them a haircut and she can cut their hair and that's great keeps them entertained for a long time doing that so just some activities that she's already shown an interest in. Yeah. That's great. Um, I also am showing a picture right now of the shapes and putting them in circles to count that you have. 
and that's a really nice looking activity. Can you describe that? Yeah, a lot of my activities. So I follow a lot of people on Instagram that do homeschooling just to get some ideas. But the thing I find with following people on Instagram, all their activities are so perfect and shop bought and beautiful or they're homemade and they're really, really high quality and take a lot of time to prep. So with my Instagram, what I wanted to show people is that you can have some great activities that the kids are really interested in and really have some good learning um, skills in there that don't take a lot of time to prep, don't need anything. So that shapes one, I just get an old calendar and draw it on the back as the kids are there. And um, is that the one with the pink and yellow ribbons or is it the wooden blocks? Okay, yeah, we've done another one. I've just, with numbers, the same thing. You have a circle with a number written next to it. And we had ribbons that day for some reason and they just cut them into millions of pieces. And to clean that mess up, I did the counting thing on the back of a calendar, made circles with the numbers and they had to put all the cut up ribbons the same amount as the number in the circles. And it was a great way to clean up. It was easy. I prepped it in 20 seconds. And they got really good number numeracy challenges there. And it doesn't take a lot of time to prep. So that's what I wanted to show with my Instagram, which I've not really got a lot of things on. But just you can have some great activities that don't take a lot of effort to get ready. Yeah, it's a good idea. Do you want to describe some of the things we can see behind you? That oh, you've done? Here, yeah. yeah. This is the kids bedroom it was their bedroom but they don't like to sleep here so it's their playroom at the moment um I'll just give you a little tour because I love this room so you can see our floor is grass as any good bedroom should be <laughs> but um yeah these are a lot of the kids artworks so I don't usually have an idea of what I want to make with their art I just let them go for it. So one of my favorite activities is to do shaving foam and paint. And we always use the backs of calendars. So we've got this really big paper and I'll just smear it with shaving foam. They put the paint on and they mix it around with their hands and it, you never know how it's gonna come out. But all these paintings up here, they're all done like that. The shaving foam paint and I'll just turn them into some artwork after we finished. Like this one, we flicked gold paint and sprinkled glitter on it and it became the starry sky. So then I cut up all the paintings and put them in frame. And these ones over here, these are all recycled as well. This one in the middle here, this is one of our recent ones. It's an actual canvas that I used to have hanging on my wall. I put it in the bathroom and sprayed it with bath cleaning bleach and all the paint just fell off it, the color came off it. So I had a brand new white canvas to use. So we just did our shaving foam paint and stuck on the shells and the glass that we'd collected at the beach this summer. And it's been made into a brand new summertime canvas. And these two here, they're not actually canvases. They are empty boxes. This one I've used one of their paintings that we did on calendar and I've wrapped it around the box and glued it on. That's a nice idea. This one is actually painted directly onto the box. Uh huh. So they've just painted on the box and then I've just stuck flowers on it to make, oops, to make it into it like a canvas type thing. And then just other ones we've done up here, they were, um, Bubbles and paint. That's another favorite. That's on my Instagram account. One of the first entries mm -hmm. shows you the bubble. Bit. But we've just done our painting and then I'll frame them with just pieces of paper, cardboard around the edge and hang them on the wall and they sort of turn into artworks. Looks really nice. <laughs> yeah. So that's another important concept, I think, when I do art with the kids. A lot of mistakes that parents or teachers will make is having an end product in mind so today we have to make this this scene or this this thing we're making this 
and the kids might not want to do that they might want to experiment so all our artwork is just experimenting basically so i'll just if i have a, a project in mind like i want to make a card for someone we'll do that first that takes 20 seconds and then i just let them go wild so a lot of other parents that would also say to me how can you let your kids paint at home but it's not actually as messy as you would think well my i always do it pretty much naked and they end up head to toes covered in paint but we just do it on the kitchen table i put newspaper down first put the paper on top and because I mix the paint with shaving foam, which is a soap essentially, when we finished, I just pick them up, carry them in the bathroom and hose them down and it comes straight off. <laughs> the only thing you've got to be careful of is if you, like the paint flicks onto the curtains or whatever, but um, yeah, it's not really as messy as most people think. So we'll use shaving foam and paint, paint a lot of time. And then we've got brushes, of course, but I want them to use other things just to experiment. They use their hands. My youngest one uses her bum. She's made a song. She's got this whole song that she sings while she's bum painting, but anyway. <laughs> and um, we use sponges, we use forks, we use rollers, we use just anything you find around the house. Bubble wrap is great. Old packaging foam and we, make stamps with vegetables a lot. Just, you can use anything you've got. You don't need to have proper art equipment to do it. Yeah. yeah, it looks like you do a lot with cardboard, but also um, I love your bubble work with your kids and how you make different bubble shapes using different toys or different things. Like uh, I've it's got a picture yeah. of your daughter blowing through some lego right now yeah <laughs> actually bubbles have always been a really big thing with me when i was at college here studying to become a preschool teacher and we had to do our thesis i entered the piano group except my thesis was on bubbles so we um our group we mixed all these different bubble mixtures tested which one worked well and we did a performance with piano and bubbles and it was just amazing very very messy but amazing but um i've always loved bubbles and there's just so much you can do with bubbles and it's so great to experiment so the lego because you know lego has little holes in it the big the big duplo ones anything with a hole will make a bubble so a lot of times when we're doing giant bubbles, we use the plastic from a fan, you know, those fans you and yourself with just the plastic bones. They're great. Or an old coat hanger, uh, the Lego, we've done that. We've, anything with a hole, you can use it. And it's really interesting to experiment. Any shape you use, the bubble always comes out round. So, like my oldest one, she was into hearts. So we made a heart shape out of wire, but the bubble is round, just really interesting. And they can blow bubbles with their hands now. And they were in the bath the other night with these giant bubbles just from bath soap. It was incredible. <laughs> and another great thing about our bubbles, we always do it on the veranda and it gets messy. Everything gets slippery and sticky. They like to slide in it like they're ice skating. And when we finish, we always do the big veranda clean. So we've got all the soap there, I just hose it and they get the brushes and they wash all the railings for me and it's a great activity. So like a lot of times these messy activities, the cleanup is a real drawback. You don't want to do the activity because it's such a big cleanup. But if you incorporate the cleanup into the play as well, kids can enjoy helping you clean up and it's just fun all the way. And then they see that it, you know, you've got to clean up after you've done your Play. and it's good in, in life experience life lesson as well and you can make it fun so we always do balcony clean up after the bubbles that's a great idea and i think that that is always incorporated in japanese schools um that's yeah. that cleanup aspect was something i really appreciated 
um, from Japanese schools when my kids were going to preschool and then even elementary school is that uh, my daughter, she could fold really well at preschool and she started folding the laundry with me at home. And I was like, this is amazing. I love Japanese school. <laughs> Yeah, I just came into the room before the talk started and noticed that all the clothes were just pulled out of the drawer. And when I looked in the drawer, they were shoved in. So that doesn't happen in our household. Yeah. Um, you had a great repurposing old clothes project with Roku. You want to talk about that? Which one is that? We've done quite um, a few. You repurpose <laughs> some of her old clothes and using a sewing machine and everything? Well, actually... Um, Pretty much everything that she uses for preschool has been repurposed from my favorite book. So I don't know if you know, but um, when you start preschool in Japan, you need a bag for your books, you need a bag for your shoes, a bag for your cup, a bag for your lunchbox. So we made all of them out of one of my dresses. Yeah, and I'm not a very good sewer and I can't follow a pattern. So I just, I use Pinterest a lot to get ideas. And there was some great ones I saw about making bags out of old T-shirts. So I kind of followed that concept, used the straps of my dress as the handles and just cut the dress off at the chest and sewed that across the bottom. And there we have it, got a bag. So repurposing clothes into her bags for preschool. And recently she was, she wanted to make an Elsa dress. Because I don't, I put it on my Facebook. I don't know if you know, but um. She wanted an Elsa dress, but I wouldn't buy her one. So she said she was going to make one. So she got out all the old baby clothes, went through and found anything blue. And she drew a pattern for the dress from giant paper. She drew a pattern of what she wanted to make. And she was cutting all the blue clothes into strips. She was going to put them together like a puzzle inside the pattern and sew them all together. And as she was doing that, there was an old dress, like a baby dress, like six month old baby, really tiny dress that had a frill around the bottom. And she said, oh, I really want to wear this. So she tried it on, but of course it was too small. So she didn't want to throw it out. She said she wanted it. So I said, why don't we cut it and sew it with another shirt? She had another like similar colored, it was a shirt actually with a frill on it. I'm just looking through her drawer now to see if I can find it. But she Oh, that would be great. Yeah. She sewed a skirt and a baby dress together and made a new skirt that she wears now. <laughs> you found some old drawings of Roku's from when she was three and then you made that into like coloring pages, is that right? Yeah, I just found an old sketchbook recently and was looking through it and they were just doodles and some of them were faces, like she just started drawing people so it was the face with the arms sticking out the side and they were so lovely and a lot of things, like because we do so many art works, you can't keep everything. So I take photos of a lot of our artworks and just keep the photos. That's another thing I like to do, just take like abstract photos of their artwork. So I keep that, that's just part of my hobby but the um sketchbook I was going to throw out and then I looked through it and I thought oh it's so lovely I want to keep them so I just kind of created themes around the picture create, turned them into something else and they turned into the really great coloring pages with little people with arms out their heads in the middle it was yeah <laughs> I love it and you made some really cute little snail crafts the other day which I've got pictures of can you describe that project are they the little rolled up ones on the yeah yeah so a lot of our projects as well they're not okay let's make this so we'll just start out doing something so the actual base of that was when we were doing bubble painting we did bubble mixture and paint and blue bubbles with straws we blew bubbles with a little thing I'd made out of an old bottle and we had this big piece of paper that was just colorful bubbly type painting and I kept that maybe you could use it for something else and then we saw a snail when we went on one of our walks one day 
And when we were in the car on the way home, I don't know which one did it. There was just some old paper in there and they rolled it up and they said, look, it's the snail. And I thought, wow, well, what a great idea. So we went home and we made snails by rolling the paper. But then that's the end of the project, just the snails. But then I thought, why don't we make it into something? So we got out the old bubble painting paper that we had and stuck them on and we made some leaves as well for them. And it turned into like a rainy season scene. Yeah, I love that. Um, you also do more uh, difficult learning activities, not just arts and crafts. I love yeah. the anatomy. What were you doing teaching them anatomy? Tell me about that. That's really funny because, as you said, I'm a runner. So I run. I don't have time to run by myself. So since my oldest daughter's been born, I took her running in the buggy for the first time when she was one month old. So she's five and a half now. So I've been running for five and a half years pushing a buggy. And now I've got two. So one rides in the buggy, the other one stands on a scooter at the back and I run with them. And when we finish, I always stretch outside our house near the river. And I was just stretching something one day and think, oh, I've got tight hamstring. And didn't think anything of it. When we came home, my youngest, who was two, hit her leg on the under, underside of the sofa. And she said, oh, I hit my hamstrings. <laughs> so instead of saying I hurt my leg, she said she's hurt her hamstrings. And I thought that was so funny. And obviously they can learn these words just from everyday interactions. So why don't we learn them? So we started learning our muscle names. So we learned some muscles and then we went on to bones and we were learning some bones names. And a really great way to teach them, to get them to use the muscles, I'd lie down on the floor with the muscle chart next to me and say, okay, can you massage my calves? And they had to find where my calves were on the chart and then massage my calves. And then I'd say, oh, my scapulas are a bit sore or my shoulder blades are sore. Can you massage them? And you get a massage and they learn the terminology the muscles in your bones it's a really great activity yeah that sounds fun very very good for future doctors and uh, physio <laughs> physiotherapists <laughs> not just moms with sore shoulders you know. yeah moms with sore shoulders yeah um and then you you've been teaching roku uh phonetics for reading yeah. you talk yeah. about that a little bit yeah so um because we're in japan I didn't think she'd have any English reading at school. So we've been doing our phonetics together and we start with flashcards and we're doing that, but um, she was getting frustrated that she couldn't read. So instead of just making like lessons or doing it together with her and she was getting like, she didn't want to do it anymore. We've got a few different like activities that we do now that use phonetics. Another uh, one that I really liked was a treasure hunt. So she was into treasure hunts. So we had a, a map and I wrote the, I drew a picture of where something was and then just wrote the word of what she had to look for. So she had to read it out to find what she was searching for sort of thing. So that was a good way to get her interest going. And another thing we do is snack time spelling. So while we're having our three o'clock snack, I'll write little messages to her and she'll read them and write an answer or write a question back to me <clears throat> and if we have like I'll kind of have in mind as we're doing it oh she didn't know this sound today so we'll have a ch sound or a shit sound and I make a little flash book of the sounds we've done that day so then when we go up like another day's snack, snack time spelling we look at our flash book as well and we can say oh we did er sound yesterday remember it had i and r and e and r so just as we're eating, just that little communication sort of thing, she seems to enjoy that and it doesn't get her frustrated that she can't read the reading book or whatever that we were working on. Wow, that's a good way. And just keep repeating and uh, reviewing by mentioning it later and over and over again. I, I've heard yeah. you, you do that with your kids. It's a great technique as a mom and also as a teacher, right? Yeah. And it's like 
I didn't think it was really sinking in or that she was interested. But then sometimes I'll find her playing with her little sister, making up phonetics games, and she'll get out the cards. It doesn't really make sense, but you can see that she has an interest and she wants to learn it and she's trying to teach her little sister. So that's really good to see. That's nice. Uh, let's talk about sock puppets and puppet shows. Okay. Yeah, um, we saw a puppet show. I think it was last summer vacation. And that's the first puppet show they've ever seen, I think. But um, ever since then, they all make puppets out of anything, really. So I think you've got a photo of some socks there. They were just old socks that I was going to throw out, like they were missing their partners or they had holes in them. But I put them in her craft box and didn't say anything. And she actually found them and made them into puppets by herself. So she used them. And then uh, we also had a, a, a magazine with neat characters in it. And she cut out all the characters, and stuck them on the back of our spoons and forks and put on a puppet show at the back of the lounge for her sister. And the funny thing was that the puppet show was just, hi, I'm Elsa, hi, hi, bye. It wasn't very spectacular, but after the puppet show, she'd line up all the puppets and then say to her little sister, okay, you can come and meet the puppets now, which is what they did at the puppet show we went to see. So she's just taken the whole thing in and just having that meeting the puppets experience at the end was so funny. Ooh, that's a great idea. And you recently did like a performing art reenactment of an art painting. I love this activity yeah. you did with your girls. Can you describe it? Yeah, that was, um, there's a gallery that we go to and every year for their yearly schedule, they reenact a painting. And this year it was Sura. It was uh, Sunday afternoon on some island, I forget what it was. But um, we all dressed up and went down to the local riverbank. And they had a professional photographer who came and set us all up and it was, just, it was really fun. But we had to get our own costumes together. And it uh, worked out really well. So I got all the girls clothes at the 100 yen corner of the second hand shop. And the character I was playing had this like hat but all I could see was our sand toys bucket that's that's the shape it was <laughs> so I was looking everywhere for a hat and I tried to make it but I wasn't very good at that so I actually just wore a bucket on my head <laughs> I love it it's awesome yeah. It looked like a really fun activity with you girls not not only doing the activity but making the costumes and talking about yeah. art and yeah, it's awesome. It was good. We looked at the painting and they had to get their pose right and we practiced doing our poses. It was really fun. That's great. Yeah. And then you've got a great photo um, with you guys coming out of a storybook with the painting behind. That's really cute. Yeah, my mom has, it's not Photoshop. I think she uses photo elements, she keeps telling me. But she's got her own personal computer teacher who comes around for a cup of tea and they figure out all these things to do and she's having a lot of fun making photos for us. That's great. Um, so we've just got a few more minutes. Um, is there anything we haven't touched on that you think is is important advice to give people if they're kind of struggling to find things to do with their kids during coronavirus or anything you would suggest trying? Yeah so for me I think if I think, oh, I've got to do this play, I have to play with the kids, it's not fun, I don't want to do it, and it gets me really stressed out a lot. And I know a lot of people would be like that. But um, just if you can find something you want to do while the kids are playing. So I always try and incorporate, for me, going to the park, looking for flowers. Or if I want to go for a run, we'll run to the park. So you don't always have to put yourself last, I think. You have to miss out on what you want to do. But then I don't like seeing the kids miss out on what they want to do. So if you can come to some sort of compromise, incorporate both your activities, and then maybe the kids will start to like your hobbies too. Like I took my five-year-old trail running on Monday for the first time and we went to the top of the mountain. 
So just when they see you doing these activities too, they might show an interest and that might be something else that they can start to learn or that they might like to enjoy too. That's great. Do you also incorporate like cooking or making bentos with your girls? Some of your bento pictures yeah. are so cute. Yeah, I'm not very good at the bento making. But um, my eldest especially is a very fussy eater. And during her summer vacation, actually, when we had some more time, we would go through a cookbook together and we'd choose what we wanted to make. And then we'd go to the supermarket and they'd do the shopping and buy what we needed. And we'd come home and make it. And I also like to use math in the kitchen a lot. So if we're doing it, they have to measure out the ingredients or they can tell me what number it has to go up to. They look in the cookbook and see, find the numbers or how many slices we need or just things like that so they can get some number practice while we're cooking and maybe that they would you know because I made it myself I'm going to eat it didn't work quite that well but um yeah <laughs> we like to do a lot of cooking together yeah and also like growing vegetables sometimes if you get kids uh helping you grow mini tomatoes or something they're more excited about eating it because they grew it I've I've heard different advice like that it hurt it works sometimes but uh yeah. Yeah. Not not always. <laughs> We've, tried. We've got some okura growing on the veranda now, and they love to go and cut it off, but they won't eat it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Goya. I remember growing Goya, you know, as a summer veil because it, it has such a nice green leaf that gives you some shade in summer, but uh, nobody likes to eat it in the house. But I, I challenge, challenge myself every year. <laughs> you have a really interesting picture. It was a mystery to me. You have a jump rope in an ice cube. That was great fun, actually. <laughs> we made ice bags. Um, <laughs> we just filled up old milk cartons or I think we had Yakult bottles. We filled them with water and froze them. They put like little bits of paper. They put all different things in and froze them in the freezer. And when they came out, of course, they're ice. The Yakult bottles I couldn't cut off, but the the milk cartons they cut off really easily and you've got this perfect square perfect cube of ice and there was a string in it so it was like an ice bag they said and they carried it around and then they turned them into ice skates so we had to make two the next day with strings in it and they stood on them and held the strings and skated out on the veranda <laughs> That was a real project. It was fun. Yeah. yeah, a bit of science, a bit of fun, a bit of science mixed together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> any any other recent uh, games or activities you did that we haven't talked about yet? What else have we done? We do something new every day. Did you make the house behind you? Is that a house, the, the playhouse? Uh, this one here? Yeah. No, we got that from our cousins, but up until yesterday, because uh, we have the autumn festivals for the shrines at the moment. So my daughter and I, we strung, we have a string that we string around our apartment building, around the houses, and you put little white bits of paper in it. Have you seen them? They're like little fluttering yeah. flags. Anyway, we had some leftover string and a few leftover papers. So she strung string around the outside of the playhouse and was threading the paper through. I didn't show her how to do it, but she was watching when I was doing it outside and she thread it through. And she made the streamers, but we ran out of paper. So she went and got origami and cut them and made her own streamers to go in. And it was, it had the string around it for the shrine festival until yesterday. So that was That's really nice. Amazing. It's very seasonal, yeah. right? For the <laughs> autumn, autumn festival. I saw you also made carp streamers. And hung them up yeah. for Children's yeah, that was Day. Thing we made like because when we keep our paintings. So as I said, we don't have a end project. We just do paintings. And if the colors are great, I'll keep the paintings and then maybe use them, like we did with the snails. Our carp streamers were also paintings that we'd done previously, and they just they were great, easy. Rolled the paper and stuck it together and turned them into carp streamers. So we try and do something for the special Japanese holidays. We'll do Hinamatsuri, the girls' festival, and the carp streamers. Yeah, we always try and do something. And Christmas, that's our big 
art project time of year. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah. Lots of great, exciting projects. Making your own wrapping paper. What do you do? Yeah, for our wrapping paper last year, we did autumn leaves and a roller. We stamped them. So we put the autumn leaves on the roller and ran them across the paper with paint. And we got some beautiful autumn leaf patterned wrapping paper. Very yeah, nice. so we always make our own Christmas tree and our Christmas decorations as well. So we've been talking about recently what we're going to do this year. Last year we collected branches in the forest and we strung them from our chandelier, from our light, and it was hanging from the roof. And then we made our wreaths with all our acorns that we'd collected and just all the seeds from the trees that we can find in our neighbourhood. So we made them into decoration. Wow, that's a great idea. Uh, one horror story from when my kids were little, in the forest they were collecting all the donguri, all the little acorns. And I was like, oh, that's great. What a great habit. We had a big box in the house with loads of acorns inside. And then a couple weeks later, it, there were loads and loads of worms coming out. It was, oh, it was mushy. infested my whole house. <laughs> you need to treat the donkeys before you use them in art projects. That's an important thing. Uh, how do you, you treat them? them? That's a very good tip. Them. Okay. Or you can freeze them or you can bleach them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We've tried all of them. Boiling it seems to split the dongodies open a bit. Freezing them works well. Yeah, good, yeah. good tip. Freeze yeah. your dongodies before you store them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love all the reuse that you're doing with all the different uh, art projects and activities, and you're trying to use less plastic. You said in your in your uh, toy buying and art projects and stuff. I know it's a real challenge, isn't it? Everything's in plastic. Yeah. yeah, but you're doing a great job. Thank you so much for joining the series and giving us some ideas. Hope you can use some of them. Yeah, well, it makes me want to adopt kids and start all over again. <laughs> it's fun to do with big kids. Like I enjoy painting yeah. with the shaving foam. It's great stress relief. Yeah, that's that's true, isn't it? Like adult coloring books were very popular a couple years ago, right? Yeah. And I was doing that with yeah. my teenagers. Yeah, that was fun. When you use the shaving foam, it's just such a tactile activity. It's really great to enjoy the feel of it, the smell of it. Yeah. Yeah. Never too old to paint with your hands, right? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining the series. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, we're back tomorrow morning. We're talking about uh, electric vehicle uh, with Kevin Meyerson. So join us at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.